Okay, we could uh, make a start. So last week we talked about uh, hearing, so how the brain hears, uh, and then moved on to kind of topics of music, and also introduced speech perception. Um, and today we're kind of following on from speech perception, recognising words, talking about other issues really to do with, uh, with language. So the main function of speech is obviously to communicate ideas from one person's head into another uh, using the medium of vibration of air molecules. So when we put it this way, this is kind of you know, an amazing skill for us to do, to transfer one idea from my head into somebody else's head by vibrating uh, molecules of air. Uh, and re really, uh, what we talked about in the, uh, the last lecture is this kind of process here about how sounds are uh, you know, recognised uh, by the auditory cortex, how you recognize speech sounds in terms of kind of, you know, patterns of frequency change in the brain and so on. They've got gliding and stopping sounds and uh, uh, this kind of thing. And then how you map that onto uh, spoken words. So we talked about how when you hear uh, a spoken word, it's kind of revealed to you bit by bit over time. <coughs> and what you do is you kind of map that onto your a store of known words. So if you hear the word spoken, it, well, as soon as you, hear, you activate all your words beginning with this, then all the words are in this, and then, and then so on. This is kind of the cohort model. Uh, but also, we, we talked a little bit about retrieving word meanings and the idea that, in fact, although I've drawn it this way, the arrows go back the other way as well. So if you're expecting a, a word like dollars, for instance, and then you get a sound, then you know it's incorrect to begin with without having to hear the rest of the word. Uh, and, and so. so today, we'll, what I want to talk about is, uh, uh, and, and then here, well, here you've got sentences and kind of more knowledge here, and then the speaker is kind of almost doing the, the same reverse. So we'll talk less about this side. Of In the first part, I'll talk about well, how is the meaning of words and other concepts kind of represented in the brain? This relates to semantic memory. How is this structured? Where is this in the brain? Uh, and so on, how do you represent the meaning of a word? And then I'll talk a little bit about sentences, how we process sentences, which really are a mixture of word meanings plus syntax, the order in which words uh, can a a appear and be combined to form kind of, I guess, higher order meanings uh, from multiple parts. So this is what I'll talk about. So how are semantic concepts represented? How's uh, semantics and syntax separate in processing sentences? And then I'll talk particularly about the Sweden for Broca's area. So semantic memory is our, effectively our conceptual knowledge of the world. So this includes our meanings of words. It includes factual knowledge and our kind of knowledge of what objects are uh, and so on. So typically, uh, because it involves all these different things, people often think of it as being a modal. So it's used irrespective of whether I hear the word table, whether I see an object at table, whether I can you know, feel it with my hands or, you know, uh, so on. That, that's the, the traditional idea behind semantics, is that they uh, have lots of different inputs into it. Although current theories kind of debate whether that's correct and uh, we should think about semantics in another way. But the idea is it links together language, it links together memory, and it links together perception. It's kind of, you know, a high-level kind of binding uh, thing, if you will. It's so here, um, We'll talk about semantic memory quite a bit in the memory lecture as well. So he mentioned there that he could still remember other things. But just to kind of distinguish it from problems in perception, if you might remember an earlier video of HGA, the guy at the train station, who was literally having problems in seeing objects where he'd see a person but not know it's his wife and say, there's a person next to me, she's following me, she must know me. Uh, and so it's not like that. He, he, um, the idea here is that, you know, it's almost as if his concepts of kind of dogs and things are all blended together into this thing called animal or cat or, or, or whatever it is. Uh, and that his vision would, would be intact uh, with that. So it's more to do with the understanding. So if you remember H.J., for instance, who had these problems in recognizing objects, and so he could talk fine, he could describe what the difference between a cat and a dog are and so on, whereas this person wouldn't. He would just say, well, it's an animal, for instance. Uh, so so it, it's to do with uh, the actual understanding of concepts rather than the visual processing of objects itself. So that's an important distinction. So how is the meaning of words represented in the brain? So often we think of the brain as having something like 
a, a mental dictionary, a kind of a lexicon. So you can imagine a word has its kind of its pronunciation, how you pronounce that word, its meaning, its um, it, its kind of syntax, whether it's a noun or a verb, whether you know uh, how you use it in a sentence, and the, this is how we kind of store words. And I think that that's okay up to a point. Uh, Searle's kind of, he's a philosopher, and he's introduced this idea called the Chinese room problem. And this um, is basically, you could imagine a person in a room who kind of knows how to process words. So what he's doing is he's answering uh, sentences presented to him in Chinese and putting them in Chinese, but he doesn't understand Chinese. He's just implementing rules that give them the answer to, uh, to given questions. So the claim here is that he's just processing words without understanding words. And you can imagine the same thing could happen if your brain just kind of stores a dictionary. So we've all had the experience of going into a dictionary, looking up a meaning of the word, and it defines that word in terms of another word which you don't know the meaning of. So you go to that word and you find, oh, this one. So how can you know the meaning of anything unless you've got a set of words uh, in your head to begin with, uh, in effect? So in a way, your brain cannot be like uh, a, a kind of a, a, a dictionary in the sense that you cannot define words in terms of other words and concepts, because then the question is how are those words and concepts represented if not in terms of each other. So a dictionary understands nothing, and you would understand nothing if your brain uh, had something in there that was kind of like a dictionary. This is the argument that he's posing here. So what is the, the, the solution out of that? It's called the symbol ground. And the, the solution, really, um, this is one of the things that kind of modern cognitive neuroscience has brought to it that was never really kind of debated before, which kind of recognizes this abstract philosophical problem. The idea, really, is um, to go away a, a bit from the idea of a mental lexicon and say, actually, uh, some of our concepts are known via other means. That in, in effect, you have some concepts that are kind of grounded or embodied. And essentially what that means is that instead of defining concepts in terms of each other, you define them in terms of our kind of experience or our interaction with the world. So the concept of green is not defined in the same way as you would find the definition of green in a dictionary in this kind of very abstract way. It's defined in terms of your experience of greenness in the world. And so it's kind of grounded in your kind of perceptual systems, your memory and your, your kind of imagery of, of those concepts. And similarly, the idea of kick, it's not kind of defined in some abstract way of moving the legs and so on. It, your definition of it is kind of embodied in the way, in your kind of mechanics of how uh, the legs move and so on. And that this effectively get, gets around this concept brand problem. There are some concepts that are not defined in terms of each other, but defined in terms of, uh, in effect, your, your uh, representation of the outside world, uh, in effect. And that this is uh, to grounding or embodiment. So now whether these concepts are kind of innate or whether they're kind of learned because pretty much everybody has an arm and a leg so we all have basic kind of shared sensory based experiences kind of debated but it's not essential to the grounding idea, uh, embodiment idea. Um, so this would be um, an example of semantic memory that is effectively fully grounded, the idea that all our concepts are is kind of residues of our perceptual experience and our kind of uh, motor experience with the world. So what we've got here are words. So these are spoken words and written words here. And this, in effect, is semantic memory. So you've got a concept such as telephone here. And the idea is that our, our, uh, our knowledge of, of telephone is kind of partly dictated by action-related elements, how you kind of interact with it you hold it in your hand and bring it to your ear, uh, uh, kinesthetic, the kind of movements, what it feels like, but also auditory properties, the ringtones, what they tend to look like. They've got you know, nine digits arranged, you know, dial or in, in a keypad and so on. Then you've got clouds and thunder, which are kind of defined in terms of visual elements, auditory elements, and so on. So this is kind of the idea that our concepts are very much grounded out there in our kind of uh, you know, sensory motor systems of the world. And that all our words are doing is kind of reinstating those, um, th those experiences from the top down, in effect. So you're, you're switching on your kind of uh, your vision, your touch, your action from a word concept rather than from vision, for instance, from seeing a, a, an object. Okay? And th th this is kind of how uh, speech and, and conceptual. 
So in this uh, kind of, this also goes against the idea of semantics being amodal, the idea that you've got something that is abstract, you're representing concepts in this abstract way, in the way that a dictionary uh, might, for instance, and it suggests that, if anything, that they're not abstract, that they're, they're, uh, they're, they're multi-sensory, if you will, would be a good way of thinking about that. So according to this kind of view, retrieving information from semantic memory is similar to the process of kind of mental imagery, uh, generating kind of images and percepts from, from ideas, uh, if you will, and, but they are synonymous with ideas, they're not different from ideas. Uh, an image is a part of what it is to have an idea. So this is the kind of experiment that's been uh, <coughs> uh, done. So here the, um, the, the task would be essentially to name pictures. So you would either see this or you see that, and you have to say the word evil. That would be your task here. But before doing that, you would hear a sentence such as the ranger saw the eagle in the sky, for instance. And what you would find here is that you would be faster to, uh, to, say, the, the, to say the word eagle, in this case, than you would there. So the claim is that when you actually heard or processed this sentence, you're not just processing it as kind of an abstract, kind of symbolic understanding, that in fact you are representing that an eagle in the sky is probably going to look like this and not like that. And of course you would have the other condition is that uh, you know, the poacher saw the eagle in its nest or something like this. Uh, and then, so you, or well, whatever, in the tree. Uh, and then you would be faster. Um, there. But, um, but, but, you know, so it's not universally agreed. I, I think to some extent uh, in the 1970s, 80s, you know, people used to be very much again into the amodal idea. And then since imaging, and some people said that when you understand things, you, you don't just, you activate parts of the brain that shouldn't be there, aren't just to do with language, they're to do with, you know, seeing and other things, even when you're just listening to a sentence, you know. Uh, and that this is kind of uh, changes for you. But other people say, well, actually, that's pushed it too far. The truth is somewhere in between. You actually need uh, abstract emo uh, concepts to represent things like abstract concepts, truth, justice, and things like this. How are you going to represent those? Uh, but some abstract concepts can be explained in this way. So uh, numbers and time, for instance, which are very kind of abstract ideas. Some people say, well, we actually represent those in our heads spatially. If you think about the electron synthesis and multisensory process and the idea that numbers, you kind of almost uh, think of 10 as kind of being a longer or further a longer line than the number 5, which is kind of, you know, this is your number 1, 5 is here, 10 is there. You kind of have this kind of pseudo-spatial way of thinking about these abstract ideas. And that would be an example of grounding, that our brains are still processing abstract things in, in terms of concrete ideas. And also the uh, emotions, which are traditionally seems very abstract. The idea is that these are kind of embodied in terms of the feelings that you have and the, situ the context and situations that evoke those feelings. That's the, an idea of you know, emotions being something that is very kind of embodied and felt as opposed to being a a something that is very abstract. Like if you look at the dictionary definition of it, for instance, you know, it's uh, uh, it be quite different from the way that we in psychologists work. So others have kind of said, well, actually, th this isn't the case. The semantic memory really is about abstract, amodal, core kind of uh, conceptual networks of features, is how they think about it. So people like Mahon and Karamats would say, the shape of an eagle is not part of its semantic memory, and they refer to it as kind of window dressing. But what it is, is that your amodal concepts would activate this as kind of a byproduct of thinking about your amodal concept. You would then activate your, your feeling states in, in the case of emotion or your, your perceptual image, but that is not, semantic memory is not stored in perceptual codes. Um, isn't there, I wouldn't have been isn't there um, earlier in the course that we learned about like the prototype model? Yes. Isn't that related to something? Yes, yes it does. And in effect, yeah, that's a really good point. It's a one L convective. So that semantic dimension patient was almost reverting to a prototype kind of four-legged animal, if you will. Uh, and, uh, and that's right. So their claim with prototype actually relates to this point here, that, um, that it's kind of needed um, that prototypes can easily be represented kind of in perception and so on, but in your concepts, you might need to make other distinctions. So here, for instance, 
uh, it's not clear conceptually or perceptually why that is different from these two. So we would call that dog, we'd call that dog, and we'd call that wolf. But in terms of kind of, we would think of that as being perhaps, you know, kind of intermediate uh, between the two. And that's not something that our perceptual systems are very good at doing. So it's almost saying we need this kind of abstract kind of linguistic dictionary style of representation in order to keep these two together and keep that one out, in, in effect. So the claim is what's happening in semantic memory is you're getting rid of your core and this will become a dog by virtue of its, you know, being part of that. Once your semantic memory goes, everything like that becomes a dog or a horse or these very simple kind of prototype of animals. That, that's the claim. So the claim is that you need it to have these differentiations. So penguin, ostrich are kind of problems as well that they become, uh, I don't know, other kinds of animals because they can't be differentiated. <coughs> So all mo models uh, kind of propose that our, our concepts are divided up into different kinds of features, but they differ in terms of whether the features themselves are amodal or kind of ground grounded, so perception image-like, whatever, whether they're hierarchical or non-hierarchical, we'll talk about that. And also, it was kind of alluded to in that little video clip, is whether we kind of represent categories as categories or whether they're feature levels. So whether we have a real category in our head of animal or that we just kind of uh, all we have is kind of eyes, has fur, and so we base our categories on the presence of these features, whether we have categories that are actually represented and marked as such, in the same way we would mark those as dog categories, as opposed to something that has an eye and goes wolf, whatever, uh, you know. <coughs> so I, I'll talk about, uh, so this is one model here of kind of concepts that, that's along this. So this is an old fashioned model of so this is hierarchical. <coughs> it has um, categories in it. So it has a category of fish in which things come off. So salmon would be a typical category uh, member of fish. Shark is a less typical category. People often think of the shark is a fish or is it? What is that? You know, it is a fish. The idea is so you kind of represent it uh, like this. Um, it also has kind of other features. So salmon is kind of is pink, is edible, swims up rubber to lays like that. So the idea is that our conceptual knowledge of salmon is made up of these kinds of features. This here, although it's got is pink as kind of a semantic feature, this is very much an amodal, old-fashioned kind of view of semantics. So here, the idea is that it's representing something that is about colour, but it's not using the actual perceptual store of colour to store it. So it's kind of almost like an abstract kind of factual proposition, uh, dictionary style definition of salmon, but not using the actual perceptual system of colour and shape and so on. So, so that would be uh, a different way of representing those kinds of facts. It's done more like a structured dictionary, if you want. Um, so are, do, do we kind of have these kind of different gradations of knowledge uh, in the brain? There's some evidence that, that we do kind of have hierarchies or di different kind of differentiation of kind of fine level knowledge versus high level knowledge. So this is an fMRI study in which you've got uh, the same kinds of images repeated, uh, probably not very clear. This one here is a um, kingfisher, car, boat, dog, ship, for instance, here. And in one case, all you have to do is say whether it's an animal or a vehicle, uh, for instance, here. In the other case, you have to say whether it's a bird or a dog. So one's a kind of a gross kind of a level. The other is the typical level at which we operate, this intermediate to kind of uh, level of bird, dog. And then here you've got specific, whether it's a kingfisher, a robin, or a duck. So you have to reproduce these kinds of either generic labels, specific, or, well, I think what they call intermediate, and this here, which is kind of suborder. And what you find is that, as, so as you kind of go along your temporal lobe, along here, it's kind of the visual ventral stream, but here, this is where you've got kingfisher and robin, and here, this is where you've got bird, dog, animal, vehicle. So you've almost got the, this kind of uh, hierarchy. And here it's vision, so it's seen as being that's your kind of low level of processing. Here you're processing as this, and here you're representing them as differentiated concepts. And this here is also where you get damage in semantic dementia in this kind of 
more anterior temporal regions, both on the left and on the right, as it happens. And this is, this is one reason why when you um, lose this part of the brain, you can still speak and have some semantic knowledge, but it's very degraded. So you know that that thing's an animal, but you don't know whether it's a robin, or, or you know it's a bird, you don't know whether it's a, a robin or a kingfisher, you know it's an animal, but you're not sure whether it's a cow or a horse or whatever. It's so you're losing that kind of finer differentiation as you go along your temporal analysis. Okay. So this here is the hub and spoke model put forward by researchers at Cambridge and uh, somewhere else. And this, in effect, is kind of a bit of a blend between uh, a grander semantics versus a, a modal semantics. So their claim is that you, it's hub and spoke, so this is a hub and these are kind of the spokes here. And their claim is that the actual kind of features, the, the stuff that makes up our concepts is grounded in our sensory motor system. So here we've got colour, shape, motion, uh, we've got actions, for instance. So, so when we hear the word kick, we actually activate our kind of action uh, system here. And these are our kind of words, so what, what words sound like, what they're spelled like, how we say them, and so on, the ones in orange. But then you've got something that is amodal and that effectively pulls all these things together. It holds all the different features, and it's not represented in a visual or auditory or motor code, it is kind of abstract in the way that we would think of a dictionary style definition. So this is effectively best of both worlds, but it's a bit of hybrid that allows for both. And the evidence for this is again that in when you lose this hub, your, your semantic memory goes down, you, be, you have this thing called semantic uh, dementia but you can still process concepts to a degree and you still have some language available to you. Um, so what this task here is, is that you show um, the, the patient's picture. Sorry, it's not very well produced. That's a duck, a uh, camel, a seal, and a frog. Then you take it away and then you ask them to just redraw what they've seen. So it's a very easy task, but it's easy for us because we can hold on to uh, that. So what you find is that they all become these generic four-legged animals, even though that doesn't even have four legs. It's kind of pretty much lost. It's got a few features, but the camel's lost its hump. The seal's flippers have become legs, uh, and the frog has become this kind of four-legged animal. With so here, you're kind of almost they're extracting the prototype out of it. They're losing uh, the details. Now, why they can't do this in a visual system I isn't clear, but but it's almost like you need your concept in order to hold on to that to reproduce it. Similarly, if they're asked to draw from memory a frog, they would draw it often as a four-legged animal, which suggests that they know a frog is an animal, but they've lost the specificity that distinguishes it, its kind of defining characteristics. And similarly here, this is naming. So they're given a picture, and they have to say what it was. And this is one patient. And you can see over time that first they call an eagle a duck, then they call it a bird, then a bird, and it goes down to horse. So as the, the, the dementia progresses and they kind of lose the concept out of the brain, everything becomes an animal. And in fact, some things become vehicles or, or strange uh, things like this. But this is particularly so for, um, for, for items that are atypical. So an ostrich soon stops being classified as a bird and starts becoming an animal. Whereas uh, you know, an eagle would carry on being a bird for longer because an eagle is a better prototype of that. So it's almost as if you're kind of retaining some semantic knowledge, but not the stuff that, that's separating you. So if you go the other way and ask them, say you show them a picture of a cat, and they go, oh, it's a dog, because that's the level they've got to. Yeah. And then you ask them, well, do you know what a cat is? Or yeah. you start probing them in that way. What? No, they, they wouldn't know. So even matching it to meow and things like this, the, the knowledge simply goes. Gone. It goes, yeah. And that's very different from people who have visual impairments who would say, oh, you know, I, I, well, I can't see what it is, it might be an animal. Then we say, what's a cat? So, yeah, you know, it does this, it's not that, but it goes. Um, so, and similarly, if they're given a carrot and asked to choose what a colour is, they might choose it's green. But the idea here is they retain the idea that it's a vegetable and retain the idea that vegetables are prototypically green. So they'd be able to do that with a cabbage but not a carrot. So they're losing their semantic memory, but what they're losing is the differentiation of it. And what they're left with is the prototypes 
which is what is left in the, the rest of your kind of perceptual motor system, the, 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 what they call the spokes. <coughs> so that's kind of damage to, uh, to, to that. What about if you were to damage, for instance, uh, these other regions, so your frontal lobes, parietal lobes, which are involved in moving the body versus your uh, visual system. So does that impair your concepts? And the evidence is that it does. Um, so what I'll report now is the idea um, that categories are kind of represented by uh, some of these different features. So, so what we can think about here, so this is the model of... Um, this is this kind of grounded model of all four, but we can think about that as the, the different kind of spokes in the Hubbard spoke model that I just talked about. But the idea is that certain categories of things depend on more elements than others. So animals, for instance, if you look up a dictionary definition of an animal, or ask you to kind of do one, you tend to define it more in terms of what it looks like, what it sounds like, how it moves, and so on. Whereas tools and animate objects, we tend to define them in terms of their functions, how we use it, what they're used for. Uh, and so on. So the idea is that different categories might depend on different kinds of uh, features within the brain that are kind of distributed uh, across them. So the idea is if you lose these kinds of elements that you'll be impaired at understanding animals but less impaired at understanding tools. So that would be one idea that categories are kind of emergent properties of these features. And this is uh, basically what, what's been reported over the years. So these are uh, not somatic dementia patients, mainly these are people who've had strokes. And, and you can find some patients who are, have good knowledge of animals, foods, and flowers, but are very impaired with inanimate objects. And this would be both from words saying, what is a dog, uh, and also from pictures. So it's kind of that they've lost those concepts. But again, you, and then you can find patients with the opposite profile. And what um, Warrington, Chalice, and colleagues propose is that within semantic memory, you've got different features which are important for different categories. So as well as kind of being able to get rid of all your semantics and semantic dementia, you can also damage different parts of this network as well. So in the case of this, if you damage these kinds of information, or your ability to access them, your, uh, your knowledge of uh, animals will go down, whereas if you damage these ones here, uh, those will go down. They call this a sensory functional distinction, the idea that animals depend on sensory features of semantics uh, and animal things depend on that. And there's evidence for this um, one there. Uh, and this is the same thing here. Uh, And again, there are various, uh, you know, ways of uh, thinking about the sensory functional thing. So some people would say, well, the actual features that are sensory is, are kind of still abstract. It means that it's about colour, it's about shape, rather it is in the thing, the actual kind of part of the brain involved in seeing shape and seeing perception, whether it's kind of different levels of abstraction in the system. Uh, but certainly more recent uh, evidence suggests that, you know, when you're asked to kind of name a tool versus uh, naming animals, you use different kinds of uh, networks. So uh, naming an animal, you use parts of the brain involved in biological motion. Uh, even when you just see a static animal, you have to say its name. You activate your kind of biological motion perception area. Whereas when you're asked to name a tool, say a hammer, just a, a static picture of a hammer, you activate your motor system. Uh, and you don't activate your motor system when you see an animal. So you, the idea is that you, you're kind of, uh, you know, embodying or embedding this kind of knowledge within your sensory and motor systems, as well as perhaps having an abstract thing, which side of the theory was. Um, yeah, I, I won't go into that, but basically there's evidence that it's not just sensory and functional, that you can have other things that, that go down as well. So it seems like you that categories can, can either be represented through this kind of hub that says a dog's a dog and so on, or via uh, the particular features that, that we have. So this is a patient who had uh, an impairment in food, so that they couldn't, um, if they were given a picture of food, they were very impaired, but they were quite impaired with animals and not with non-living things. Uh, so they're particularly worse with food here. So that's matching the word and the picture together. 
giving a description from a word that was simply bad with food, fruits and vegetables. But again, this patient could also um, match food to color. So they could say that a carrot was uh, orange and so on. So it wasn't that they'd lost the sensory properties of this. It's almost that the category of food had uh, kind of disappeared from their knowledge, but their, their sensory features were there. So it's almost as if sensory features and category information are kind of two different levels within the system. And there are other patients who, uh, who have problems kind of matching drawings to colours. So they can see colours, but they can't decide from a, a black and white line drawing what the colour of it is. But they can still say that a carrot is called a carrot from a black and white line drawing. So, so again, it seems to be that there are multiple kinds of uh, aspects of this, that you could represent the colour of something separately from, uh, uh, from, from the shape and from the actual category itself. So this is um, damage to kind of body parts, it, certain damage to parts of the brain, particularly your parietal lobes, means that when you're shown a picture of, say, um, a knee, you might call it an elbow, or you see a picture of the ear, ear eye, you call it an ear. So the idea here is that you're kind of, you're degrading your conceptual knowledge, but you still have sub-knowledge. So you call a joint a joint, and a part of the face a part of the face. So it's almost that you're, uh, you've not lost your knowledge, it's that your knowledge is becoming undifferentiated or noisy. But again, it's not that all knowledge is lost. So um, they can, if, you, if you say, where would you wear a tie or a glove, they can point to it. But if you say, where is your hand, they can't point to that. So they obviously know a hand there, but they can't link it to the verbal label. Uh, so, so it's almost as if their, their knowledge of body parts has become kind of degraded, uh, but they can still point to body parts when they're asked, where do you wear a glove? Where do you wear your glasses? But their eyes and their nose, they just know it's somewhere on the face, and they're not sure which one is which. It's very curious. And similarly, um, actions and verbs as well. Uh, that they can be, if you damage your frontal and parietal lobes, which are involved in kind of uh, action, uh, then this can affect your ability to understand words such as lick, kick, and pick, and so on. Another thing that's shown is that when you actually hear these words, when you hear the word lick, you activate the face part of your motor cortex. When you hear the word pick, you activate the finger part of your motor cortex. When you hear the word kick, so you know these are just purely words that differ by one phoneme you activate different parts of your motor cortex. And, um, and oh, sorry, I haven't put that in there. But if you apply kind of TMS, so you disrupt uh, those different parts of it, it affects your ability to process sentences involving those words in them. And some people have claimed that, uh, you know, it even affects more abstract things, such as to kick the bucket. If you damage your motor cortex, it kind of impairs your ability to make these metaphors. So some people argue that, um, uh, it supports the idea that to some extent you're kind of branding these concepts from that. Right. So, so here, these are your actions in the front lobe, the parietal lobe uh, there. So when these go down, it impairs your ability to understand certain kinds of words, but not others. So bodily processing in more parietal lobes and so on. So these kind of category-specific deficits can arise when you damage the particular features uh, of them. So this enables categorization of typical features uh, with that. And the idea is that you've got something that is like a hub that produces this global impairment, which affects all categories. But when it goes down, what you're kind of left with is this uh, very coarse, kind of undifferentiated semantic knowledge in which, uh, in which all your concepts kind of become a little bit blended together, but you can still re resort to prototypes, you can represent prototypes. But this here helps to kind of keep uh, a carrot green, keep an ostrich as a bird, rather than uh, an animal, and uh, so on. <coughs> so, um, so I think that the debate's kind of swung around over the years, and this is kind of a good compromise between these two positions. Any kind of questions? Right, so in the, the second part, we'll talk about syntax and word order, how you process sentences as opposed to single words. So we'll have a break and come back at about the end of the month.
Okay, so in the second part of the lecture, I'll talk about processing of sentences. The sentences are essentially a mixture of kind of semantics or word level meaning and word order or kind of syntax, if you will. Uh, I'll talk about what Broca's region does, both in terms of language, sentences, and perhaps also in terms of speech production. It's one of these regions that people have attributed lots and lots of functions to in language. So no, there is no single uh, answer to it. So perhaps there are multiple functions, or maybe it's a function that we haven't yet kind of fully grasped. Um, so parsing is kind of the process of putting words into sentences. So the idea is when you listen to a sentence, such as the boy hit the girl or whatever, the, uh, each word you hear you kind of categorizes, this is a noun, this is a verb, uh, so here the word hit is a verb. You kind of have an expectation of what the structure is based on you know, your language as to how nouns and verbs appear. But you have these kind of categories, grammatical categories in effect, that determine what goes where. Uh, and these in effect, uh, uh, determine also um, the meaning of it. So here uh, you've got three different sentences uh, and A and B have this different meaning but the same syntax, uh, whereas A and C have the same meaning but different syntax. So again, um, to some extent the, the word order tells you who is the agent and who is the object and so on. So the girl was him, the boy, the, uh, the girl was obviously the being hit. Or is the first to the action. Uh, and you get that from knowing uh, information about the word. But the, the individual words themselves do not convey that. You need to have that abstract kind of structure. Uh, so, okay, and people often study this using either kind of grammatical and ungrammatical sentences, or also sentences which are hard to process syntactically. So, these are often called garden path sentences. So uh, the horse race past the barn fell. When you encounter this, it's like, what, what's the word fell doing there, for instance? Or the second one, fell until the man that he had risked his life for to install a, a smoke detector. When you get to the four, it's, it's quite hard. So it's, you kind of almost want to be found until the man that he had risked his life, uh, that he had risked his life. Uh, and then it's like, oh, what's that word doing there? And what it means, you have to go back and think of a new way of ordering the words in order for it to make sense. It's the idea it involves kind of a different syntactic analysis from the one you're expecting. You have to go back and create a different kind of uh, tree uh, as to what it's doing what. So here, the, um, the man with the interest is life or is the um, uh, it's kind of a different kind of units of uh, phrasing and stuff. What happens in the brain when you count the word fell or the word for that you kind of une unexpected syntactically? Um, in EEG, um, so when you encounter these words, you get a, um, a, a deflection in the, the waveform at, at about 600 milliseconds, it's positive, and this is what's called the P600. And people say it's, it's kind of a bit of a neural mark the fact that you're reanalyzing your syntax, that you're trying to reassign the, the words to make uh, the sentence uh, make sense. So again, here, this is uh, the 600 means 600 milliseconds after hearing the onset of the word, so hearing the word fell or four in these cases. I notice again that in the last lecture, we talked about the M400, which would be, uh, for instance, you get an M400 if you say, I like my coffee with, um, milk and dog, for instance, you can for the dog. So dog is syntactically appropriate, but semantically appropriate. So dog is a noun, it, it is the right kind of thing that should appear in that sentence, but it's semantically wrong and you get an early one. So again, it suggests you've got sy semantic and syntax with two, uh, at least separate stages in time. Uh, don't worry about the fact that what's next to Does that mean that syntax is more intense in terms of brain processing than semantics? That wouldn't seem to make logical sense. Um, possibly, is it more demanding, the fact that it occurs later? Uh, you could perhaps argue that. It's certainly different. I guess to some extent, um, I guess you need to get the word in order to know that it fits a bit more with that. Is that, is that right? It depends on the context. So some 
some violations occur earlier than that, uh, depending on what they are. So sometimes um, uh, th there's an earlier marker, for instance, for that. So if you've got a completely different thing, so instead of having the word dog, if you have something that's a verb, for instance, you will also get a different kind of one. In there. But it's a good point. Why? Yes, it's not clear why it couldn't be earlier. It, it would imply that, that, that it, it, you require a prerequisite of knowing something about the word, or at least processing the individual word. Yeah, that's a good point. I've got to come across that. Um, another evidence, so you get the P600 when a sentence is ungrammatical, also when it's grammatical, but in which you can't figure out what it is. But you get it even when a sentence is semantically meaningless. I don't know whether this comes to a point here. But here you've got two sentences, neither of which, they both contain words. Uh, so the, word, the phrases are, the boiling watering, the boiled watering can smokes the telephone in the cat. Okay? Now that is meaningless, but it is actually syntactically well formed. Whereas if you say, the boiled watering can smoke the telephone in the cat, that is meaningless, but it is um, here, you get a P600 for the word smoke because it, it, it makes sense to say smokes in this context, even though there is no meaning for it. You still get a, the, the P600, which is the, diff, the shade of bit here in grey. You could say you are getting a P600 for smoke, it's bigger for the other one. So, so it is here that even when you've got words that are meaningful, a sentence that is meaningless, you still get it when, uh, uh, when it's not something that is grammatical. So we can say that syntax and semantics are at least partially independent. Um, so there's other evidence that if you provide context, um, you know, then you can avoid garden path sentences. So if you kind of introduce a narrative about you know, the, the fireman and the man with the smoke lot. So when you come to that sentence, it makes more sense. You don't have the P600, you don't have this uh, problem with it. <coughs> Uh, and again, if you have semantic dementia, you can make grammaticality judgments, even if the sentence contains words they don't understand. Here it means probably words they don't fully understand. So for instance, here, a semantic dementia patient would be a, a, okay uh, you know, a doing grammaticality judgments uh, with things like this. So knowing that the word smoke should have an S of it in that case uh, here. To some extent, they can do that. Um, <clears throat> but, but the two also kind of interact as well. So uh, also patients with semantic dementia, they tend to form fairly meaningful sentences uh, uh, as well. Uh, I won't come into this. In uh, brain imaging with uh, people who don't have kind of uh, neurological problems, there's also evidence for different brain regions as well. So they in this study, they varied uh, the semantics, so they either had words or non-words that were presented. And then they varied the syntax by varying how um, uh, complex the sentences were syntactically. So an example of a non-word sentence would be, I to see that you should beget. And you kind of need those middle words in order to get the, the syntax. If every word is a nonsense word, then there's no syntax. Whereas here, you can still process the syntax, but have no meaning to them, okay? What you find is that the distinction between words and non-words activates the same part of the brain that's involved in processing uh, detailed semantics. This anterior temporal lobe that we saw earlier when you're processing single words, so distinguishing kingfisher and other types of birds, distinguishing kind of unique instances, this detailed semantics, uh, responds when you vary the content, but not when you vary, have a, a syntactically complex versus simple sentence. Uh, so, it's a, so here, for instance, C is syntactically more complex than A, even though they both mean the same. Okay? It's just harder to kind of pass that. Uh, whereas you get other regions which don't care whether they're um, words or non-words, but they care whether it's a syntactically simple or syntactically complex construction. And these include um, Broca's area, which we'll talk about, which is in your left frontal lobe, and also another region in your temporal lobe, near the auditory cortex there. So the claim here 
uh, that's often made is that you've got uh, these three parts of the brain. You've got your anterior temporal lobe that processes uh, semantics. You've got your Broca's area in the frontal lobe that processes syntax. And then you've got another region of the temporal lobe that effectively pulls these together would be another way uh, of looking at that. So what do we make of, um, and that isn't this one, this isn't one. What do we make of uh, Broca? Yes. Um, if the posterior temporal lobe is supposed to process both of them, why does it only respond to one of them? Um, only respond to... Only respond to syntax and not to Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a... You are... That's a very good point. <laughs> yes, it should respond to both of them. Um, yes. The, the, I think that the one... Yeah, you're right. The one, it, it comes from other evidence, so basically the broker's area would respond to a uh, syntax that isn't uh, language-based, for instance, whereas the temporal lobes would only respond to syntax that is language-based. So you're right, this study doesn't show that, but it would come from other... That's very good. So what do we make of a uh, broker's area? What's it doing? So this, is a, this lies a little bit out of context, but it's kind of you know, taking us back a few hundred years to what people used to think broker's area did and what these other regions used to do. So these are the, the kind of things we already talked about. So um, this is our kind of concept sense, which we would think of as being pretty much distributed throughout the brain, but having at least some speciality in the anterior temporal lobes. In the 19th century, people thought that you've got words were effectively you know, divided into two kinds. You've effectively got auditory images of words, or you know, hearing words versus motor production of words. And it used to be thought the broker's area, of broker's aphasia, was to do with producing words. Okay? Uh, and since the 1970s, people have thought, well, actually, it's not involved in producing, but it's involved in syntax. How has this change come about? Uh, well, it's come about through various lines of evidence. So one of the, the problems before is that when broker had his patients, they actually had very large lesions that weren't just in his area, they were in other areas that probably affected kind of the motor cortex as well, and other things that were involved in generating the movements of the, uh, of the mouth and the, the, the tongue and so on. Uh, so, so that's one other thing. But also, it was originally thought that if you had damage to broker's area, you, uh, you had problems of producing speech but not comprehension. And th this has kind of changed uh, over time. So the old idea was that Broca's area was involved in producing speech. The new idea was that it was involved in, um, in syntax. So let, let's kind of do this. So Broca's, in Broca's original patients as well, they also had problems in producing any kinds of speech. Um, since then, most people thought, well, they do actually produce speech, but in fact, they produce what's called a grammatic speech. So when describing this, they would produce cookie jar, fall over chair, water, this sort of thing. Um. Stuhl, is it a boy? Is it that landing down? A girl is laughing. And cookie jar, um, okay, um, window, curtains, and the out the uh, garden, and trees, um, low grass, and, um, uh, Lady washing the dishes and uh, uh, hot and cold water pla flash plashing running floor and uh, two cups of uh, so we can debate what that is, what the problem is. Clearly, she has you know a speech production problem. Um, she's able to articulate words, it, you kind of have a sense that she's able to um, uh, understand it. It's almost like a frustration that she knows what, what to say and so on. And uh, the original thought is that these patients can kind of comprehend things very well. 
what they can't do is actually get out meaningful sentences. So she was, so she was getting phrases like hot and cold water, uh, but not producing kind of larger sentences. Um, but she was she almost going through the same curtain, window, and, uh, and kind of phrase level like things, but not producing sentences. So it's, you know, it, she's clearly able to produce speech okay. It's, it's a question of structuring it and so on. So one idea is that Brexit aphasia might be linked to what the symptom that's called a grammatism, so producing sentences. Uh, so again, the, the focus, uh, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, is still on, pro on production rather than on comprehension. And the reason was when you get these um, in daily, daily living, for instance, the patient seemed okay at understanding lots of things. And this kind of changed in the 1970s uh, by giving them more complex sentences. So in order to, um, okay, so in order to process uh, more complex sentences, you, you need to uh, uh, be able to uh, process the word order separately from the meaning. So let me kind of talk you through this. Um, so this is, yeah, okay, so this is a good example. So the control sentence here is the girl is kicking a green ball, okay? And you could present various kinds of, in, uh, so what you would do is you would, uh, the patient would hear the sentence and they would have various pictures and they'd point to the correct one. Here, this, the meaning of this sentence is semantically constrained by the fact that girls kick balls and balls don't kick girls, okay? And similarly, this is also constrained. So the wagon that the horse is pulling is green. Um, so that's semantically constrained by the fact that horses aren't green, okay? Uh, and if you were to then, um, right, uh, so then if you've got a sentence such as the cat that the dog is biting is black, for instance. Here, it's not clear whether it's the cat or the dog that's doing the biting. This cat could bite a dog and a dog could bite a cat, uh, okay? Uh, so you, you can swap them around. If you look at the last one, it's here. The line that the baby is scaring is yellow. The patients are awful at that because they assume um, that it's the lion that's scaring the baby or the baby that's scaring the lion, okay? Uh, yes, it's the lion that's being scared, yeah, yeah. The lion that the baby is scaring is yellow, okay? So you have to point to the picture of the baby scaring the lion. And here, the idea is that they're using this, uh, their uh, semantics in order to kind of constrain their, their syntax. And it's only when you get these kind of unusual sentences that you see that they go down, where it's not clear from the, the words themselves as to who is doing what. So these two are constrained by the fact that, you know, that horses aren't green and that balls don't kick girls, whereas the other two are kind of constrained by the fact that it's normally lions that scare babies and not babies that scare lions. So their syntax seems to be down, and the reason why production is more impaired is that you have to actually have a detailed understanding Whereas in comprehension, your semantics can compensate for your syntactic disorder in most real world cases. It's only when you get uh, to kind of complex scenarios in which uh, the meaning of a sentence can't be inferred from the spectrum. What is the importance of having both the reversible sentence and the improbable sentence? Um, so here, uh, yes, I, 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 I'm not sure that there is. I, in this case, what you I don't know if it's significant, but here what you find is that they actually go below chance. So here it's kind of a 50-50, knowing whether it's the cat, the, the dog, the dog that's here. In, in this case, it's almost that they go the other way, that they then override the idea that it could be a baby that's scaring a lion, that that's, it becomes an impossible uh, you know, thing, and that they're just basing, they're guessing it based on the, the thing. So uh, I, but I don't know whether that difference is significant. It doesn't look into me, but that, that would be the thing that you might expect. You might expect, in fact, that that would go below chance, given a 50-50 uh, set of pictures. So this led to the idea that Broca's area might be a, a kind of a syntactic uh, module. Is it a syntactic module? Well, certainly, again, you know, there is evidence for FMI that it is involved in uh, syntax. So here, that, that is Broca's area here. And here, this is just varying the complexity uh, syntactically of different sentences and showing that the more 
uh, load you place on it, on it the, the more it responds. One of the problems was is that in the 1970s, uh, there wasn't really a use of brain imaging. So any patient who was achromatic was called broke as aphasic. And it, what subsequently turned out is that you could also damage other parts of the brain and lose your uh, uh, ability to process sentences and maybe also even have Broca's aphasia because all it was was inability to produce sentences. So although Broca's area is involved in sentences, what you find is some patients have damaged their temporal lobes also have similar uh, problems. And this again leads to the idea that there's uh, multiple regions involved in syntax that weren't really appreciated so it's not the broker's area is the only syntactic processing uh, region. But it is important for syntax and it's relevant for syntax. And I think another myth is that people kind of went to the assumption is that syntax is the only function it has to play in language. And, and most people don't believe that. They think it's involved in other things as well. Um, <coughs> So th this is uh, Broca's area here. This is your kind of semantics. The idea is that this is all involved in processing sentences, but it perhaps involved in linking semantics and syntax together. Broca's region is also involved in processing artificial grammars. I don't know if many of you know Zoltan's kind of research with this. But here, this is kind of not language-based grammar. So language-based grammar is about nouns and verbs and knowing how they can be combined. Here, it's just that you take arbitrary kind of rules as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed with other things. It could be objects or symbols or whatever, they're, but they're not words. Uh, they're, they're just meaningless sentences. The Broca's region is involved in kind of making grammaticality judgments about, say, strings of letters or objects, whether they're, they're appearing in the right order and, and so on. Uh, whereas these temporal lobe regions seem to be specific to language-based So it's not that Broca's area is specific to, uh, to language, and it's not that it's specific to syntax, okay, because it's involved in non-linguistic syntax as well. What's the other thing that's kind of happened really as a result of fMRI and other studies is kind of a parcellation of Broca's area into two regions here. Um, so this here, region here, seems to be more involved in um, so these refer to different labels, so area 44 or area 6. These seem to be involved more in syntax and also perhaps in some aspects of speech production, but not, not the actual kind of movement of the draw, or the kind of planning and so on. Whereas these ones here seem to be more involved in semantics and so on. So if you remember in another lecture, we talked about um, evidence, for instance, if you give somebody a word like cake and you have to generate a verb, uh, for that, that this involves Broca's region. Is that because it's, you know, uh, word retrieval or semantics or syntax? We don't know, but it certainly does involve them. Um, so it's involved in working memory, kind of controlling semantics, kind of disambiguating uh, things. So what's the evidence for that? Um, so this is a, an imaging study where basically in one case you're asked to judge whether a word is a concrete or an abstract uh, concept. And what you find is that doing that judgment activates the, the anterior part of Broca's area, whereas judging whether it's a noun or a verb activates the posterior aspect. So again, when you're giving them the same word and you're just asking them to make two kinds of judgment, one to do with its grammatical category and one to do with its semantic category, you get these two different regions. This is another imaging study that compares working memory with uh, syntax. Okay, it's quite uh, complex. But again, it's something that other people are puzzled about is that typically when you've got syntactically more complex sentences, they uh, pose a big constraint on your working memory. So maybe it's not really syntax at all. Maybe it is just working memory. And this study is one thing that tried to pull them apart. So what they have is what are called long and short kind of sentences where you're effectively waiting uh, to the end of the sentence before uh, it's dangling. So this is a l an Im long embedded sentence. So Mir Maria who loved Hans, who was good looking, kissed Johan. Or Johan. 
So you've got to wait all the way to the end of the sentence to know who Maria uh, was snotty, you know, in effect, in this thing. So this is a, uh, a place with a large amount of working memory. Whereas you could have it that effectively you get to that quicker and then you're left with other information afterwards, so that would be short. So here this would be, um, this is demanding working memory and that isn't, whereas this is demanding syntactically, whereas that isn't, where you've got all these kind of different branching structures. Um, and what you find is that you again get differences within brokers areas. So the, the more anterior region, which is involved in kind of semantics, control, control of semantics or whatever, responds to working memory, and this posterior region responds to syntax. So here, this responds to uh, a more complex, where you've got this very nested structure, and this responds to having to wait a long time before you find out who's done what to who in the sentence. So, uh, so again, brokers area seems to have these multiple functions in language. Uh, it is relevant to syntax, but it's not the only part of the brain that's involved in syntax. So this is just summarizing this. So does it contain the most primitive speech? The people I didn't know. But certainly, uh, it, uh, we talked about kind of the mirror neurons. When you hear speech, you might activate your motor system. It might be, at least part of it, might be involved in that. That's what current um, It was originally thought it wasn't involved in language complication. It is, but only when working memory demands are high or when the, you need syntax in order to understand the meaning of the sentence by itself. Uh, is it specialised for syntax? To some extent, but it's not just specialised for syntax. It does other things, uh, and it's not necessary. And its syntactic role might apply outside of the language as well. <coughs> Any kind of comments or relatively clear? I think it's you know. It, so there isn't one clear take-home message with this, except that we probably shouldn't be calling it Broke's region. We should have different names for the different uh, regions and we think uh, that. <coughs> so to, um, to kind of close the loop, what about kind of producing uh, speech itself? If it is a broker's area that's doing it, what region is it that's doing it? What, what's involved in the actual uh, articulation production of speech? Well, there are various regions uh, that, that are involved in this, that are involved in kind of motor control. So, so, for instance, the, uh, the insula and the basal ganglia have problems in articulation. So, for instance, the, the patient with damage to, uh, well, we assume Broca's area, the, the little clip we saw last time, her words weren't slurred or that they were well articulated. But patients who have a practice of speech, they often produce words that sound slurred. It's often described as sounding like a foreign accent. It's called foreign accent syndrome as well, sometimes the literature. They're not really talking in foreign accents. It's just that it sounds weird uh, to the perceiver. The, um, the, the first case of this was kind of in uh, Norway, the 1940s, when they were kind of invaded by the Germans, and everyone thought that this Norwegian woman was talking in a German accent, and they kind of ostracized her. Well, she had, she had a brain damage that made her talk in a funny way. Uh, they was kind of perceived in the, as Germanic by the, the locals. Uh, but, but anyway, it doesn't, uh, not everyone talks like a German when they, uh, they practice the speech. It, it, it just sounds uh, different. Um, so so the, again, uh, the, the insula seems to be linked to, uh, to, to other regions. <coughs> Does Broca's area have any role in, uh, in it? Well, it might do. So for instance, these mirror neurons that respond when you uh, see an action uh, or see somebody uh, speaking, for instance, uh, that, that are kind of involved, like in the McGurk collusion, when you see somebody moving their, their jaws and so on. They, 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 uh, your motor region close to Broca's area does seem to be involved in that. So it might be involved in kind of linking what you hear and what you see with kind of motor commands, but it's not act the actual motor commands themselves. Those are kind of in other parts of the brain. But it might serve as kind of multisensory. <coughs> Yeah, so, uh, so here it's kind of your basal ganglia and your insula kind of involved in the 
kind of preparing and executing your notes out.